Well, hello again. Welcome to Horror in Detail. Today we are going to share Wendigo and Cryptids Encounter Stories. First story, Wendigo 1860. Tim points his gun and whispers, I see it, but it doesn't see us. I snapped him we don't have the time nor the resources for this. Let's go before, that was when the it in question a Wendigo pointed its head straight up with a crack and began to sniff the air before twisting and writhing unnaturally with the sounds of a million bones snapping. I was drawn out of my awe when Tim's gun went off, and in an instant, the beast leaped towards us only missing us, cause I pushed Tim behind a tree. Sometimes I get ahead of myself. I was a small-time bounty hunter, and Tim he was a bartender and self-proclaimed master tracker. I'd take him along with me for jobs that I couldn't handle alone. The only problem being, he was a bit of a hothead. Never seemed to be too much of an issue, till he tried talking pot shots at something darn near bulletproof. Anyhow, after I pushed him behind the tree we got a scurrying, like a couple of raccoons that was just hit with a broom. We quickly got up the short hill, and I got to making a plan before it was on us again. Neither took long, Tim had ideas of his own however, and began to shoot at it. The creature was on him instantly, and it pulled back its arm when I shot it getting its attention. It turned and looked at me while I had it distracted. Tim wriggled the muddy 16-bore shotgun off his back and blasted the creature in the face. It stumbled back off of him stunned at that moment I grabbed my rifle and shot it again. It leaped for me and I dove behind a fallen tree the creature landed on hard on a large portion of a tree, getting impaled. Now the way I got this odd job wasn't exactly normal. One day while pursuing a shop an old man approached me, he said he'd give me $500 to kill the creature that lives in the woods on his property. So of course I took the job, I figured it was just some crazy guy in the woods or a coyote or some wolves or something. I took him just in case I had any trouble. After the thing impaled itself on the tree, it writhed and screeched. Tim got to his feet and shot it again sending an antler and some bone chunks flying. It wasn't dead. As it started to pull itself from the tree me and Tim bolted. It was just them that I remembered that the old man had given me a stick of dynamite. I turned lit it and tossed it into the tree next to where the creature was implied. Just as it pulled itself from the jagged stump, the large oak fell trapping the creature. We ran and we didn't look back. When I returned to the old man's shack there was a note with $500. The note said thank you for freeing me of this burden. I never saw the old man again. Second story. I went to Rapid City to hunt, not knowing I was the prey. I know monsters exist. Trust me, as crazy as that sounds it's 100% accurate. I had a hard time convincing myself at first. You try and substantiate the things you have seen. It's just an undiscovered species. That was my go-to explanation when I killed the first one. Me and a couple of my buddies had planned a hunting trip down to Rapid City, South Dakota, best place to go for year-round game. Since around the age of eight, I'd been making this place my very own sandbox. I knew everything about it, the lakes, trails, and those beautiful mountains. When we arrived, we set up camp, readied our equipment and set out to plan a few traps for breakfast the next day. It was here I knew something wasn't right. As my friend was tying down a twig into one of the snags, we all heard a sharp screech rip through the idyllic woods. It caused my friend to slip and the snag ended up closing on his finger. Whilst we were bandaging it up at the camp, the same screech ripped through again. Shrugging it off as an aggressive owl call, we headed off to sleep, all feeling uneasy about the crappy start to our trip. I had one of the worst night's sleep of my life, if you could call it that. I tossed and turned, kicking around in my tiny tent, until I heard a crack outside that made me freeze. The fire was burning out, and it was casting the long shadows of the trees onto the side of my tent. I listened as intensely as I could and watched in mounting fear as the shadows started to change. Another dark shape was weaving in and out of the uniform line of trees popping up behind one and each time reappearing bigger, which meant it was getting closer. Now as an experienced hunter I knew, there was only one plausible explanation for this, a bear. These fuckers don't give a crap if you've got a fire going. If they smell food, they're coming to have a look. I reached around my tent for my backpack and searched through it as quietly as I could, the shadow now blocking out all the other trees. It was right outside. Quietly I pulled out my hunting blade and tried to think of a plan. It would have been useless to try and take the bear full on. This isn't the revenant. 
a bear will rip you in half without even blinking. I'd have to try and run for the car. The rifles were in the back. There was a noise from my other side, and I realized one of my friends must have opened their tent. I saw the shadow flicker in my peripheral vision, and when I turned to look it was gone. Then I heard the scream. I was out of my tent within a few seconds, haphazardly looking around and holding out the knife. In front of me was an image that will be burnt into my mind until the day I die. My friend, the one with the bandaged finger, being held in the hands of an abhorrent creation of God. It was at least nine feet tall, standing on two legs, hairless, with a curved spine and long saggy ears. Its face was sunken and littered with cuts and scars. The wounds were festering and rotting. Its mouth was blistered and blood poured out of its gums which were on full show, further enhancing its yellow jagged teeth. The monster was holding my friend between both its hands, claw-like and piercing into his abdomen. I screamed at it, and it snapped its head around to look me dead on. The eyes were black and lifeless. Without blinking that fucker ripped my friend in two. As the blood and flesh scattered around the place, I saw my other friend's tent start to open. The creature must have seen me looking because it turned, and within a second was ripping at the tent opening. I took a chance. As it was reaching into the opening to rip my other friend to shreds, I pelted over and stabbed it in the back. It reared back and screeched as we had heard before, reaching over its shoulder to pull the blade out. I pushed it backwards and it fell onto the embers of our fire, and began to roll around screeching more and more as the hot ashes burnt at its skin. My friend had stumbled out next to me and after seeing the top half of our buddy, slumped at the base of a tree, we beat this thing into a bloody pulp. We didn't stop until the sound of bone breaking turned into muscle mushing. Our hands, chest and faces were dark red with its blood. Fucking weird coyote, my friend mumbled after a while. That was the first one. We reported the incident with the police. They assumed we must have been mistaken with our explanation. They actually assured us it was probably a bear or cougar, and our imagination had filled in the gaps. My friend was quick to eat that up. To this day, he's never talked about it with me. But to be honest, I haven't spent much time with him. I've been obsessed with finding out what in the fuck that thing was. I'm happy to say I made a decent amount of progress. I returned to Rapid City about a month later. I'd been online and posted about my experience on some forums, I dunno. I thought there must be someone out there who knew something. I was right. Another outdoor enthusiast called Kevin responded and told me how he'd come across something similar quite a few times. We arranged to meet up. Kevin told me how he'd grown up around the place, gone hunting with his father since he was a kid. He said the locals knew there was something dangerous up in the mountains, but they'd never been bothered by it until a few years ago. He called this creature the Wendigo. Let me just say though, it don't matter what folk tale or name you give something. If it's a monster, it probably existed long before humankind and has no concept of stories. That's another thing I think us humans do to try and substantiate things we can't explain. We give it a legend. Kevin told me how certain parts of the mountains were off-limits due to unexplained disappearances. He offered to take me to a place he knew the Wendigo liked to congregate. On the way he filled me in on some of the details. Wendigo were fast, extremely strong, had fantastic hearing and hated fire. He tapped his backpack at this and winked. If we see any of those little shits they'll be going up in flames. That night we reached the base of Black Elk Peak and Kevin took me around through a hidden path to an opening carved right into the floor. It was about 50 feet wide and pitch black. I have no idea how far it went down. That's where they've been coming from. We found this about six months ago. Wasn't here before that. There's numerous other ones around the way, but we've had a lot of activity here, Kevin said, peeking down into the hole. We secluded ourselves between some trees and faced the hole, crouched in the dirt. Now if we see anything, you need to stay quiet. Take your photo, and we can leave okay? Kevin whispered. I told him I needed a photo of the Wendigo, so I could prove to the police they existed. Sure Kevin, I whispered back, whilst squeezing hard onto the Glock hidden underneath my arm. We waited, and waited. The sun had gone down and the cold had really picked up. Kevin was talking about giving up when we both heard the sound of earth being moved. Squinting I saw the top of a head protrude out of the hole, warily raising itself up. Kevin had not let me down. There, pulling itself out of the hole with those huge claws and drooping skin was the Wendigo. 
This one was smaller than the one I killed, but it made up for it by being twice as ugly. It cracked its neck upwards and started to sniff at the air. Its tongue flipped in and out of its mouth like a snake. Then it arched back and let out that terrible screech. I felt the ground shake slightly and Kevin grabbed hold of my arm. I hadn't even realized, but I'd pulled out the gun. Don't you fucking dare. Kevin whisper screamed at me. Better get those Molotovs ready. I said and turned to look at the opening. In the short time it had taken for Kevin to admonish me, there were now five Wendigos standing on the edge of the hole, staring directly at me and Kevin. They were all different heights and all had trouble standing straight, leaning into their claws, with a focused and hungry leer painted across each rotting face. I shot first. By the time the first Wendigo's brains had hit the ground the other four were already galloping at us, tearing up the ground and emitting those deafening screeches. I turned to help Kevin, but he was already lighting the rag of a petrol bottle. He threw it, and it shattered into flames in front of the beasts. They scattered around the flames, still gunning for us. I shot another in the shoulder, and it crashed into the ground, writhing around. Another stopped to help it, so I took a shot but missed. It flinched as the bullet whizzed past and turned slowly to face me, its lips curled and teeth bared. I took another shot, but its fallen comrade lunged upwards and caught the bullet in the back. It fell into the flailing arms of the one who had tried to help it, and they both crumpled to the ground. The other two had reached Kevin who smashed another Molotov at his feet. A surge of flames erupted in front of him like a wall and engulfed one of the Wendigos entirely. The other jumped away like a kangaroo, but went crashing into a rock, stumbling and finally falling to the floor, breathing rapidly. I shot at the one on fire to stop it running around screaming. It hit the ground, charred and whimpering. Within ten seconds this lovely little slice of nature had turned into what looked like a war zone. Kevin was on the floor panting and I was leaning against a tree, trying to catch my breath. We both caught each other's eye and started to nervously laugh. That's when I learned one of my most important lessons. Never take your eye off the ball. It felt like a hot whip had been slapped across my face. The Wendigo who'd stopped to assist the one I clipped had snuck up and slashed me right across the face. I felt the chunks of skin rip off my cheekbones, and I fell onto the ground unable to see, and with only a faint buzzing to hear. I blacked out. Of course I survived. It's kind of a spoiler considering you're reading about it all, but yeah. It didn't get to kill me that day. Thankfully Kevin was able to scare it off before it sunk its teeth into me. He told me afterwards he only had one Molotov left, so I should feel grateful he wasted it on me. We've become pretty good friends, one good thing to come from all this in any case. Of course I told the police what happened, but they're not interested. It's bad for business I suppose. Nobody wants to go hunting where they could be the prey. Just be careful if you go down to Rapid City. There's something there that's not afraid to tango. And remember, fire is your friend. Third story. My son brought something home from the woods. My husband and I always wanted our son to be adventurous. We wanted to watch him grow up asking questions about everything, seeking out answers, and looking for adventure. It seems like whenever parents have a deep desire for how they want their children to be, their children instinctively know and go the complete opposite direction. As Sam grew up, he became very introverted and would actively ask when it was time for bed. He loved to sleep, and our doctor gave a lot of explanations. All the illnesses had been checked and crossed out before he said, I think he just likes to get away from reality. He likes his dreams more than he enjoys life. This was at the age of eight. This actually depressed us as parents. What could be so wrong, so uninteresting about his life that he would come home and just sleep? The doctor recommended that we plan family activities that were geared towards him as a way to engage him in life. Give him something to be excited about after school. So, for our very first trip, we decided we would go on a hike. The mountains were about an hour away, and we considered this a mild introduction to our new family habit. When we told Sam where we were going, he was ecstatic. We knew then that hiking had been the right activity. On Saturday, we threw together some backpacks, lunch, water, and even a magnifying glass so Sam could inspect everything closely. He was so excited the entire way there. We were all thrilled. When we parked at the trailhead, Sam leapt out of the car and almost ran up the trail without us. I had to call him back so we could keep an eye on him, 
The hike was short, maybe half a mile, but Sam tried to run it like a marathon. We kept calling for him to come back and check out this bird, or this butterfly, or the log that looked like a grandpa's face. He would come and look to humor us, but then run ahead. Eventually, we gave up trying to point things out and let him just run through the woods. We were pleased that he had taken so well to the trip. For once, Charlie and I felt like we knew what we were doing as parents. Anyone who's a parent knows how that feels. We got to the end of the trail and ate our lunch. We were at a ledge along the mountain that was more like a hill. The sun was high overhead, and we could see over the trees for miles. Sam quickly downed his lunch, and we let him run off into the trees. Not too far, I warned him. He obeyed, and we could always see him. From the rock where we sat, I watched Sam while Charlie went to the bathroom. I watched Sam pick up sticks, swing them at bushes and tree trunks until the stick broke, then pick up another one. He picked one up that was too short to be swung, but he smiled wide at it and ran around with it in front of him, using both hands. Finally, he ran over to me and said, Mom, feel this stick. It feels so cool. Oh yeah. I grinned, taking the stick from him. It was in the shape of a Y, and when I grabbed one of the sides of the Y, it was perfectly smooth. It looked like someone had taken a knife and whittled a bigger branch down into this smooth, slingshot-shaped stick. The two sides of the Y were curved, almost like bicycle handlebars. That's very smooth. I said to encourage him. He looked at me funny, then ran back into the woods to keep playing. We packed up lunch, stuffed everything back in the backpacks, and announced that we were ready to hike back. Sam came back without a fuss, and we began walking down the trail. Instead of running ahead, Sam lagged behind, still clutching the Y stick. He held it in front of him with both hands as before, and was swinging it around slowly, as if it were a magnifying glass and he were searching for something. Come on, Sam, Charlie encouraged gently when he stood in one place for too long. We both had to stop because he had fallen so far behind. He was pointing his stick into the trees, arms outstretched. He kept looking from the stick to the trees, as if trying to line something up. We both waited patiently for a few seconds, but the heat was getting to us and we were ready for an air-conditioned car. Sam, honey, let's go, I called. Okay, he called back, but didn't move. Charlie sighed and walked back to him. He put his hands on both of Sam's shoulders and guided him down the trail. The whole time, Sam kept both hands firmly on the stick and tried his best to point it back towards the trees where he'd been looking. He didn't point it towards where he had been standing, I noticed later, but at a spot past the trail and into the trees. Always at one position. Charlie finally got him to where I was, and we kept walking. Sam eventually stopped pointing his stick, and instead kept it down in front of him, both hands still being used to hold either side of the Y. We drove home, pleased that Sam was taking home a souvenir. Our day trip had worked. He was getting involved with life. We were one step closer to our adventurous son. Over the next couple of days, lots of things started happening. They all seemed disjointed and not connected in the moment. Later, memory would connect them for me. Sam went back to his sleeping routine. He would come home from school, go into his room, and play for a bit by himself while dinner was being made. I got him to work on homework, then served dinner when Charlie got home. After that, he went straight to bed by his own choice. This wasn't abnormal for him, so I wasn't any more concerned than usual. A few nights after we got home, I noticed that Sam's bedroom light was on even though he'd gone to bed hours ago. His door was closed, so I want to go and turn off his light for him. I figured he might have left it on when he fell asleep or something. The second I opened the door, Sam leapt off the floor and jumped into bed, like he knew he was in trouble. It was only 7 in the evening. I wasn't about to yell at him for not going to bed when he said he was. His rapid jump into bed had me worried though. Sam? What's up? Nothing, he said in that kiddish tone that screams I didn't do anything. I looked around the room and saw what I always saw. His toys were out and lined up in some game he must have been playing. Nothing was out of place or irregular. You jumped up as soon as I came in. Anything wrong? No. Okay, I said slowly, unsure of what else to say. He looked at me with untold terror in his eyes. Are you sure nothing is wrong? I pressed. I can hang out with you for a bit, if you want. He stared right through me, his eyes wide. It took him a few seconds to reply. No, mother, 
I'm going to bed now. See, can you turn out the light? I blinked. He's never called me mother in his life. I should have pushed myself in and sat on his bed and talked until he admitted what was wrong. But I didn't. Charlie called my name, and it distracted me. I wished him a good night, turned off the light, and shut the door. Talking later on with Charlie about it, Charlie thought that maybe he had somehow discovered masturbation, even at his young age. When you rub around on the floor the right way, it just happens, Charlie told me. Apparently, that was how he had discovered it. So, I chalked the situation up to that. Sam also kept carrying that Y stick around everywhere. He always kept it within reach. During dinner, he kept it on the table. When I told him that sticks don't belong on the dining room table, he kept it on his chair next to him. He took it to bed and kept it next to his head. He even took it to school. I tried fighting him on it once, but he claimed he was taking it to show and tell. I was about to insist that he leave it home, but he looked like he might cry if I came down firm. So, I let him on the condition that if his teacher mentioned it to me that I'd make him leave it home. He agreed. One day, Charlie was taking out the garbage and the bag caught on the door jam. The contents of the bag spilled all over the floor, and he quietly cursed and went to get another bag. That was when he found about 20 of Sam's toys in the trash. They varied from stuffed animals to action figures. Confused, Charlie asked me if I had thrown them away, or was punishing Sam for something. I told him no, and was equally puzzled. Sam, for some unknown reason, had been throwing his own toys away. Together, after dinner, we sat down with Sam at the table to ask about the toys. We saw it as a cry for help. They were selected, he said in response. They weren't doing a good enough job, so they were fired. Their time was up. Charlie told Sam that we don't throw toys away because they cost money and we don't waste things. Sam nodded, but I saw his hands clutch the sides of the Y stick tightly under the table. He was stressing. Something was going on. We ended the conversation on a light note, and Sam understood why we were upset. He promised not to throw away any more toys, then ran off to bed. I just remember thinking how strange the sentence was, their time was up. That was an adult's line. Not something you hear from kids. Sam's school sent an email to all the parents, about two weeks after our hiking trip. The principal pleaded with parents to not let their children come to school if their child was sick, as there was a very serious flu going around the school. He even admitted that five teachers and 30 students had been sick over the last week alone. I showed it to Charlie, but he didn't find it as weird as I did. Hand sanitizer breeds superbugs, he shrugged. Just tell Sam to wash his hands more often. The final straw for me came a few nights later. It was a Wednesday night when I woke up for no reason. Charlie was snoring next to me, but in a lull between snores, I heard a whisper. Fear seized my throat, and I lifted my head off the pillow slowly to peer at the bedroom door. Someone moved in the dark, stumbling along. Someone small and short. Sam. Irritated. I got up and walked to the door. I saw Sam skip away, as if he were crossing a field of spiders and was desperate not to get any on his shoes. Sam, I whispered, walking out after him. I turned the corner into the family room, but he wasn't there. I heard bare feet race across the kitchen floor, and that made me angry. The little shit was hiding from me. I walked through the family room and noticed that the clock on the wall was way louder than usual. Or maybe I was hypersensitive because I was exhausted. When I entered the kitchen, Sam was facing me. He stood next to the fridge, and the small LEDs on it lit up his expression. He was terrified, and his little Y stick was pointed right at me. Sam, I hissed in annoyance. It's late. Go back to bed. I need water, he said, still looking at me with wide eyes. It was an obvious lie, but one not abnormal for kids caught up past their bedtime. Okay, then get some water, I sighed. Can you get it? He asked, still clutching the stick and pointing it my way. He must have seen my mom look, because he re-emphasized. Please. I walked forward, and that's when I noticed that he pointed the stick around me. He was pointing at something behind me. I whirled around really fast and stared into the empty darkness of the family room. The clock was still noticeably loud. It sounded like a person saying the actual words. Tick-tock. Tick-tock. I looked around the room for a full 30 seconds. Nothing moved. What are you doing up, Sam? I asked, turning back to face him. He looked at me with real, 
true terror in his eyes. The stick was shaking in his hand. Sam, I hissed, snapping a little bit. It's not time yet, he stuttered, barely glancing at me. His gaze was transfixed beyond me. I'm not ready yet. For half a second, I wondered if he was pretending to sleepwalk. Then I wondered if he actually was sleepwalking. Then my tiredness washed over me, and I got irritable again. It's time for bed, I insisted, walking towards him. Still, he kept his eyes behind me, and the stick pointed into the family room. Okay, okay, he said, defeated as I approached. He took slow, unwilling steps towards the family room. I stood behind him, watching to make sure he went to bed. I saw his head look back and forth, scanning the room as he entered. He was looking for something. He looked back at me with uncertainty. Suddenly, he screamed. M.O.M., watch out. I instinctively whirled around, hands up and ready to attack whatever was there. Nothing. Nothing but darkness and the far kitchen wall. I ground my teeth and glared down at him. He was still shaking, pointing his stick into the empty kitchen. I was beyond annoyed now. This stick had been out of control for weeks. I think you need a break from this, I said, snatching the stick from his hand. No. No. He screeched. Sam practically leapt at me, but I jumped out of the way. This was the only way, I assured myself. This stick wasn't healthy after all. Don't. Don't. He cried and yelled, following me through the family room and into the hall. All the attention that he'd pointed into the kitchen was now directed at me. He tried to jump and grab at the stick, but I held it above my head. I felt like a teenage older sibling, teasing my younger brother. But this was necessary. I regretted waking Charlie up, but I pushed my way into my room, tossed the stick onto the floor, and turned back to get Sam out. Give it to me, give it to me, give it to me. He demanded without taking a breath. I pushed him out and shut the bedroom door. I flipped the lock on the handle and sighed. What's going on? Charlie mumbled. I took the stick away. He was playing with it all night, I sighed, coming back to bed. Sam was pounding on the door. I convinced Charlie that we should ignore him, let him tire himself out, and tomorrow we would lecture him. He verbally agreed, though I could sense that he didn't agree inside. It took an hour, but Sam gave up, and we went to sleep. The next morning, my throat felt like I had swallowed sandpaper. The flu. Of course. My stomach rumbled and rousted me out of bed. I found myself starting to run to the master bathroom after my stomach turned nauseous. I puked up spaghetti from dinner the night before. Stumbling out of the bathroom, I had to move aside for Charlie, who couldn't make it to the toilet and threw up into the sink. Not you too, I sighed sympathetically. I haven't been this sick since I was a kid, he moaned, rinsing his mouth out. I rubbed my eyes, still tired from Sam's ordeal last night, and got in the shower with the lights off, hoping it would help my light sensitivity. Charlie decided to call in sick and rest for the day. I got ready for the day so I wouldn't lounge around in my pajamas all day, feeling even more sick. When I was completely ready, I unlocked the bedroom door and stepped out. Sam was nowhere in sight, which meant he had gone back to bed. Good. Sam, I hope you're getting ready for school, I said loudly. No reply. I went to his room and found the door shut as usual. I twisted the handle and pushed, but the door was stuck. The hell? I muttered quietly. Using my shoulder, I shoved hard against the door. I heard a clatter, then the door opened. As I entered, I saw three things right away. One, a chair had been placed under the door handle, preventing it from opening easily. Two, the window was wide open, with the screen missing. And three, Sam wasn't in his room. We called the police immediately after searching the house from top to bottom. If we hadn't called them, I have no idea where we would have started. Should we have driven around, looking for him? Called his friends' houses to see if they knew where he was? The police were helpful, and I spent a miserable half-day sitting by the phone, puking my guts out and worrying about Sam. The police were out driving around, searching for Sam with his picture taped to their dashboards. Charlie was dead asleep when I wandered into the bedroom, debating lying down, but I couldn't sleep while Sam was missing. The sickness would let me, of course, but the guilt of falling asleep while this was going on was too much. I saw the stick, which had landed partially under the bed when I threw it last night. All this because of a stick? Maybe the doctor was wrong. 
Maybe he did have something wrong with him, but it was mental, psychological. Maybe instead of a doctor, we should take him to a psychologist. In an attempt to stay awake, I decided to search the house for the fifteenth time. This time, I carried the stick with me. Sam, I said, loud enough to be heard while I walked through the family room, kitchen, and to the stairs. Maybe he was hiding in the storage room downstairs. Maybe behind a few boxes. Sam. I said again. I have your stick. I'm sorry I took it. Please come out. Mommy is really worried. You aren't in trouble. I descended the stairs and halfway down. I thought I heard him reply. It was faint. Far away. The words were impossible to make out. Sam. I cried desperately spinning around on the stairs to try and figure out if he was upstairs or downstairs. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a leg dart around the corner at the bottom of the stairs, towards the storage room. My hunch was correct. I sped down the stairs and turned the corner. The door was closed. I tried to twist the handle, but he had locked it. Sam, honey, open the door please, I pleaded while reaching for the key at the top of the door frame. When he didn't unlock the door, I stuck the key in and twisted. The door popped open to reveal our pitch black storage room. The room was in the middle of the house and had no windows. It contained our water heater and the control system for the heat and AC. The room was so large, though, that Charlie had built shelves for us to keep our seasonal decorations, our camping supplies, and extra food and water. Sam, I said more quietly, feeling uneasy. Something about the room was getting to me. How does the clock tick? Mother. Sam said from somewhere in the room. I froze. The word mother made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Something's not right. Something's not right. S. Sam. See come on out now. I stuttered. Light spilled in from the doorway, but it didn't illuminate enough of the room for me to search. I slowly stepped toward the center of the room where a string hung down from a single bulb in the ceiling. With one hand, I kept a hold of the stick. With the other, I reached out to search for the string. I couldn't see it, but I knew it was there somewhere. Suddenly, the door slammed shut, and at that exact instant, my hand brushed against hair. Long, greasy hair at my shoulder height. Sam wasn't that tall. The hair was tangled and long. I yelped and jumped back, startled by the door and the hair simultaneously. Sam giggled. Do you know how the clock ticks? It came from my left, along the wall. The hair had been to my right. What else was in here with us? I was paralyzed. I couldn't see a damn thing. My phone was upstairs, so I couldn't use that as a flashlight. The ceiling light was somewhere in front of me, and the door was somewhere behind me. Every time I started to reach out, I remembered touching the greasy hair and recoiled. Charlie! I called upward, hoping he could hear me. Hoping he was awake. Tick-tock, tick-tock, Sam said again. My brain instantly remembered the sound the clock had made the night before. It was the same voice. Faintly a voice, and faintly background noise at the same time. Sam! My voice hoarsely whispered. I had to throw up again. I swallowed bile, and felt one more time for the string. It brushed my hand, and I jumped back before realizing that I was feeling string. Not greasy hair. Resolutely, I launched my hand out and grabbed at the string. It swung into my hand and I yanked on it, hard. The single bulb buzzed to life, and something moved to my right. I screamed at the top of my lungs when I saw white and black. It's taken me a long time to place the shape, but now I'm certain. A deer's skull partially covered by stringy hair darted away from the light, circling behind me. In absolute terror, I squeezed my eyes shut and didn't dare open them. In the battle for fight or flight, I turned into the ostrich, burying my head and hoping it didn't see me. I started sobbing and wanted to run for the door, but I was too scared to open my eyes. Mommy? Sam called from my left. I didn't respond. I was sobbing too hard. Mommy, help, I'm stuck. Very, very slowly, I moved one finger and looked to the side. Sam was huddled up on the top shelf. I couldn't see his face, but I saw jeans and his favorite shirt. See, come down and let's go. I whispered. I can't. It's going to get me, Sam whimpered. I tried hard not to sob again. Come and get me, please, he begged. I fought through the terror and stepped toward the shelf, 
still covering my face and using a small gap in my fingers to navigate. When I reached the shelf, I closed my eyes and held my arms up. Climb into my arms, Sam. I'll get you down and we'll go get your dad. My voice broke at the end. I'm stuck. My shirt is caught, he cried. Okay, okay, I said, trying to be brave for him. Guide my hand to where it is and I'll get you loose. He paused. It's at the back of the shelf. You can't reach. I bit my lip to stop its trembling. With both eyes still closed, I placed my hands on the top shelf and my foot on the bottom shelf. The stick was placed on the shelf so I could use both my hands. I hoisted myself up so I could reach and balanced precariously. Where is it, honey? I asked, refusing to open my eyes. Reach here, he said, and I could feel him rotate so I could reach over him. I did and my hand ran straight into a mess of tangled, greasy hair. My eyes opened in shock. It stared back at me for only a millisecond. In that millisecond, it spoke. Not with words, but in my head. Do you know how the clock ticks? It is fed by death. The shelf under my feet collapsed, and as I fell, my hands pulled the shelf until it toppled over, coming down on top of me. I woke up in the hospital, much to Charlie and Sam's relief. It was a tumult of information and questions. They asked why I was down there, and instead of sounding insane, I said that I'd been searching for Sam again just in case. Sam had been found walking on the road in the general direction of the hiking spot. He wasn't very far, thankfully, and was unharmed. When Charlie practically yelled, asking why the hell he had left in the middle of the night alone, Sam said he needed to find another stick to stop the monsters. The police were, of course, recommending that he talk to a psychologist, they'd overheard the conversation. Charlie didn't wake up until the police were at our door with Sam in hand. That was about an hour after the shelf had collapsed on me. Sam and Charlie had gone looking for me in the house and found me under the collapsed shelving. The police had been right there, thankfully, and I was rushed off to the hospital. Some of my ribs were broken and so was my left leg. The shelf that had collapsed on me had held our camping tent, the fake Christmas tree, and a few other half-empty boxes. I was lucky that it wasn't the food storage shelving. The door was locked when they got to it, and the key wasn't in the lock, so they had to break it down. The second Sam saw the scene, he apparently stood over me in a protective stance, looking all around. Charlie left to get the police before they left upstairs. A couple of days after I got released from the hospital, and after Charlie had recovered from a flu that knocked him off his feet, I gotta talk to Sam. I asked him outright what had been going on. It took a few minutes of him denying that anything was wrong. I saw the monster, I admitted, which a parent really shouldn't do to their child. You did? He asked incredulously. I nodded. You and dad never saw them before. When did you see them? Them? I asked nervously. Sam told me what had been happening for the last few weeks. He had stumbled upon the stick by literally tripping over it. It had spoken to him and he took it to play with it. Whenever he had the stick, he could see the monsters. They were scary, but they stayed away when I pointed the stick at them, he said. A few of them had followed us home, walking alongside us on the trail. They came into the house at night and snuck around. They came into Sam's room, our room, everywhere. They told me that someone had to die. They told me that you had to die. So, he offered the monsters toy sacrifices to satiate their hunger. They were unsatisfied. Whenever I didn't have the stick, I could feel them try to grab me. But they stayed away whenever I had the stick. They kept telling me that your time was up. Whose time? Yours, mommy. They sat with him at night and changed TikTok at him. They tried to convince him to put the stick down. They offered him candy that the big, blurry man pulled out of thin air. At school, they followed him and said they would hurt people until he put away the stick. Five teachers and thirty students got the flu while they threatened that. He held on to the stick as often as he could and patrolled the house at night to keep them out of my room. That was until I took the stick. Apparently, he had grabbed the stick from a skeleton in the woods. It looked like an animal skeleton. He had seen another one just like it when he got the first one. So he was going to go back and get the second one so the monsters would stop smiling. One had followed him on the streets, he said. But now, they were all gone. And after looking through the mess of the collapsed shelving, so was the stick. Sam told his psychologist about our conversation. 
His psychologist told me very angrily that I should not have admitted anything like that because it fed into his delusions. He was being looked at for possible schizophrenia. I'm thinking I should be tested too. How else do I explain everything that happened? One detail stands out that I can't explain. I had unlocked the door to the storage room and left the key in the handle. So why was the key found dangling from the light bulb string? Fourth story. How my father survived an encounter with a wendigo. All know the feeling of hunger, and yet some have never seen it. You yourself may have claimed to be starving, empty, famished, or hungry. But have you yourself ever encountered the merciless beast we call hunger? Have you ever considered that the thing you call starving is only the fingernail of the monster that plagues the minds and souls of the innocent and sane? Breathing down your neck and clawing at your skin with blood-covered nails, desperate to get inside. Only blocked from you gobbling down cheeseburgers, pizza, donuts, fruits, and veggies. And yet some have come close to hunger. Some of the worst instances of mass hunger known as famines have plagued us for centuries. Ireland 1845, Russia 1921, China 1959. And yet even in these stages of hunger, when people's teeth were gnawed and broken from eating leather and dirt, and animals had a feast of the bones and rotten flesh of human remains, very few have ever seen hunger, few have seen the Wendigo. All the Wendigo ever feels is hunger, for it is hunger. You may have heard of the Wendigo, seen drawings of it. But for the few who have seen it, for most it was the last thing they ever saw. I haven't seen it. No, thank God I haven't seen it. Yet the blood that runs in my family have seen it, stared at it in its hollow eyes. This is not my story, this is my father's. When I was around the age of 15, he told me to sit down next to him, pointing to the brown cloth chair. I was old enough to know, he told me, why he never lets me set foot in the woods, why we never go up north, especially never when it's winter. I recorded it all, he requested for that, wanted a record of what happened to him, to make sure no one else went through it like he did. This is what he told me. Father's story. He takes out a cigarette and clicks a lighter until a small blaze, and puts the small flame to his cigarette, taking a puff before starting. My uncle decided it was time for me to visit the Great Lakes forests, told me, the woods were some of the most beautiful in the whole country. It took a lot of convincing until your grandfather decided it was fine for me to visit the north. Of course, when he made the decision, it was winter by then. The winter down here is a light breeze compared to the freeze up in the north. Cold days and dark icy nights. It's a wonder how the Native Americans managed to survive months of thick snow and the creatures that came with it. He pauses to take another puff of his cigarette before continuing. This didn't stop my uncle who had prepared in case we had to go during the winter. He for both me and him as if we were going to the Arctic. Thick puffy jackets, fat boots, and gloves as well as goggles in case we came upon a storm on a walk, as well as bear spray if we came across wild animals. He also packed something else, a .50 action express desert eagle, the ones those cops use in the movies. He didn't actually expect to use it. It was just in case we came across a bear or lynx, and things got close and personal, he pauses and stares at his right leg. He definitely didn't think we needed it for something different. It was around mid-November when we took the plane to the state of Michigan. He had purchased a standard hotel room in a small town, he refused to mention its name, and we spent the most few days simply getting used to the sceneries of where we were. My uncle was right. It was beautiful, actually. I don't even think the word beautiful cuts it. I could see the edge of the forest by my window. They were tall like long hairs protruding from the head of Mother Nature. And along those hairs lied the fleas. Squirrels, chipmunks, birds, and the occasional wolf and fox would pass by, before despairing in the shadow of the trees. I'll tell you, even now I do miss seeing the trees, watching the wind blow the tall fines in harmony. He sighs and puts out his cigarette on his wooden chair, but I know I can never go back there. Almost every day we went on hikes, with the snow crunching beneath our feet, stopping every so often to witness the wildlife. Once or twice we came across a bear. I was scared of course, but my uncle had faced plenty in his time living there, so of course he knew what to do. Don't look them in the eyes, he would whisper to me, as he pulled out his bear spray, just in case. And eventually, it would move along, searching for some berries to eat. 
It was around our second week there when my uncle decided to take me on my first night walk. So, we put on our coats, snow boots, and brought along the desert spray and desert eagle. It was somehow even more gorgeous in the dark than it was in the day. The stars flowed above us like fireflies welcoming us to the forest, as the moon as big and bright as ever hovered above us. We walked until we came upon a fork in the path. We usually would go left, as it much longer so we could experience the forest longer, but it was a lot colder than usual, so my uncle decided it was best to get back sooner rather than later. For some reason, the colder weather did hang in my mind for longer than it should have. Although the weather could be unpredictable, the weather news where I was, was more accurate than the ones down in the north. This thought slept my mind eventually, reasoning that every news channel got it wrong eventually. So we continued, but as we went it just kept getting colder and colder. By this point, my uncle repeatedly kept looking up at the sky, with a bewildered look on his face. Looking up I saw not a single cloud in the sky, nothing to indicate a snowstorm was coming, or anything that would cause the weather to get this cold. Soon my uncle put me close to him, to make us warmer. It wasn't a long hike back, just a mile or more. Then it was clear something was wrong, more than the weather. As we kept walking, we steps, fast steps. My uncle jerked his head in that direction, instinctively pulling out his bear spray. Looking past him, I could clearly see several pairs of eyes in the shadow of the trees, moving fast, moving toward us. My uncle had quickly raised the bear spray and put himself in front of me, screaming to get packed. Looking over, I could now clearly see it was a wolf, mouths open, panting and stamping its feet on the ground, creating loud cracks as the snow fell beneath them. Looking up, uncle had his fingers straight on the bear spray trigger, ready to blast them straight in the shouted faces. Then the wolves ran right past us. I mean right past us. They were maybe ten feet away from us at most, moving so fast I could feel a small gust of wind push against my face. My uncle put down the bear spray and looked around Dusty, in complete utter confusion encompassing his whole face. That's when I saw more eyes. He motions his hand in a circle around him. There had to be dozens of critters and birds. Running, they didn't even stop to look at us, they were just running. All the animals I had feared, all the critters and birds, and all sorts of things in the woods I had stared at in amazement just days before. All of them were running. I had never seen anything like it in my life, nor did my uncle. He decided that it was time to go, most likely because whatever the animals were running from was something that we didn't want to come across. Now my uncle was someone that doesn't get scared easily. From the stories your grandfather told me, he had faced death more times than he could count, coming across an angry grizzly, a hungry pack of wolves, and even someone pointing a gun at him straight in the face. Even then, I didn't see fear in his face, but looking into his eyes, I could see worry, and that was enough I needed to know. Our standard walk had turned into a jog, with uncle deciding that it would be fast to go off trail through the woods. On the trail, there was a clear opening overhead for the light of the moon and stars to shine through, but off trail, the pine needles blocked most of the light that came through, with small beams piercing the thick hide here and there. My uncle just kept walking straight, straight towards the town. He probably just had half a mile left when he suddenly stopped, making me bump into his back. He didn't move, didn't even make a kind, almost like he had stopped breathing. Uncle? I asked in a squally voice. I looked ahead of him, my heart pounding against my sternum as it pumped blood like a bicycle pump. Up ahead was the outline of a person, though it was too far away to see any facial features or any features at all. It was, I don't know, 30 seconds before my uncle started backing up, gesturing me to do the same. Hello, can we help you? I heard a tremble, it was a small one, but it was enough to tell me everything I needed to know. My uncle, one of the coolest people I've ever known, was scared. Slowly, ever so slowly, my uncle put his hand behind his back, moving towards the bear spray. But my eyes nearly popped out when his hand went past the bear spray and moved toward the gun. Crack. Up ahead I heard what sounded like a small twig break, and breaking eye contact with my uncle's hand looked forward back at the figure. He had taken a step forward, stepping on a small branch that poked out of the layer of snow. And with that step, there was a new feeling in the air. It wasn't the cold. It wasn't fear. It was hunger. An almost lustful amount of hunger. 
Look, my uncle said, as his hand still gradually moved towards the desert eagle. We don't want any trouble, we're just trying to get back to town, so if you could please. He didn't get to finish his sentence. By this point my father stopped looking at me, instead looking out the window. It all happened too fast. First, there were the steps, fast, rampant. Each step came with a snarl. It was too fast for my uncle, too fast for me to process. What came next was the gunshot. It rang off the trees, bouncing back into my ears making them ring like a church bell. He got one shot off before it got to us, one shot off, before it made him scream. It slammed into him, flinging both me and his gun to the left, slamming me on the ground with a loud thud which knocked the wind right out of me. Oh God! The screams! It didn't kill him quickly, I didn't see it happen, but I heard the crunch of teeth going through flesh and meeting bone. It probably stopped there for a second, to savor the taste of the blood against its rotten teeth, before it continued. I'm glad I didn't see it happen, but I could well damn hear it. Splish and splash, as blood poured on the ground, as it continued to sink its teeth into his flesh, seemingly hard for it to hold back. It had enough of the taste. Now it wanted to eat. Crunch after crunch came, followed by tearing and popping sounds. I think it was pulling the organs out of his stomach. Don't know how long I had my eyes closed. But the... I opened them. I was facing away from them, and looking at a light that bounced off a silver object. The desert eagle. I stood, up still shaken from the fall. The funny thing was I wasn't scared. My brain must have taken a hit, making it difficult for me to process what was happening behind me. I took a casual step forward, towards the gun, cracking the show beneath my feet. And that's when the crunching stopped. That's when I remembered where I was. We both turned around at the same time. Its eyes meet mine, and my eyes meet it if you could call them eyes. I say this because I don't even know if they were eyes. They were black and hollow and black. I say black because all there was in those eyes was black. Then there was the rest of its body. I couldn't believe the thing that did that to my uncle was unbelievably skinny. Its ribs poked out of its chest, bones clearly seen through its slender arms and legs. There were antlers that looked like that of a deer, protruding from its head. He pauses and thinks for a moment. No. It wasn't a head. It was his skull. Cause that's what it looked like. A skull with deer antlers coming from the top of its head. And even as it crouched I could see it was tall even towering over me in that stance. He both stared at each other for what felt like hours before it turned back around and continued eating what was left of my uncle. Did it even care that I was there? Why didn't it just attack me next, just get it over with? I didn't stop to ask these questions, I just turned, picked up the gun and ran. For a second I considered taking a shot, but I didn't know if the bullet my uncle shot at it hit it. If it did, then I don't even think bullets affected this thing. All I knew was I had to get away. So I kept running, and running, and running. What probably took just ten minutes felt like an eternity. And then I saw the lights of the town. I'm gonna make it. I thought, hope creeping up my spine and into my brain. And that's when I heard the distant footsteps. I turned around for a split second and felt that hope come crashing down all the way to my toes. There was probably just one thousand. Meters away, I could see its eyes, they weren't glowing or anything. They were just so black they stood out even in the darkness. And it was running, running fast. I couldn't believe my eyes how fast this thing was running. I would bet all the money I have this thing could easily beat a gazelle high on cocaine. I turned my head back around and continued running, putting all my strength and energy into my legs to just get away from this thing. But the steps just kept getting closer and closer. Now today I understand why it didn't eat me before. Because it knew that no matter how much I tried to run, it would never fail to catch me. And it did. A jolt of pain tore through my entire leg when it clamped its teeth into my leg, the teeth reaching my femur and making a small crack in it. This thing had unimaginable strength to pick me up in its mouth and flung me several dozen feet. I landed head first, shock and pain staring at my head, spreading throughout my entire body, but soon the pain was going away, as I felt myself slipping away out of consciousness. In the background, I heard it crunching, savoring the little bit of meat it got out of my leg. This is it. This is how I'm going to die. I believed it. I truly believed it. But then I heard it. Get up. It was my uncle. 
You aren't going down that easy, are you? The words were all I needed. Every emotion in my body. Hopelessness, fear, sadness, despair. We're all replaced by one. Rage? I turned around and pointed the gun which I managed to keep a hold of, and pinter it straight at its face. It turned, seemingly shocked that I had a weapon in my hand. But soon after, it charged. I wasn't aiming for anything, just pulled the trigger, almost seemingly in slow motion. I saw the bullet fly, and go straight into the void that was its eyes. Time stopped for just a second. Then it stumbled backward, grabbing its face, and I heard it scream. For the first time in the recording, I saw fear flicker in my father's eyes, and then he continues. When I saw it open its mouth, I expected a monstrous bellow, or a loud shriek. But what came out was worse. It wasn't the sound of a monster, but the sound of a people. Hundreds of people. Men and women screaming in pain and agony. The elderly shrieked in terror. I could hear babies crying, and toddlers screaming as if they were denied a toy. But one scream remains in my mind forever. The only reason I can't ever forget what happened that day. Because I heard a specific scream come out of its mouth. The scream of my uncle. The rage was gone, and the terror returned. I got back up and continued running towards the light. I didn't want to get away from it. I just wanted to get away from the horrible screaming. But I couldn't. I just couldn't. No matter how fast I ran, the dream stayed the same. But then it changed, for it was no longer screaming of pain, but screams of rage. I continued running. I had to get away. I wanted to. I needed to. My femur's crack was continuing to grow as I continued running. My lungs pressed against my rib cage as my body demanded a huge amount of oxygen that the lungs could not provide. I remember bursting through the woods, welcomed by the bright street lamps and the hard pavement beneath my boots. And when I had burst through out of the woods, my body had used up all its strength and I fell. The last memory I got before blacking out was the screech of tires, a man looking over me on the phone, and before I lost consciousness, I turned my head and turned toward the woods. I saw it, standing there, one eye closed, the other empty sigh staring at my own. I didn't need to see its face to know what it felt. It was angry, it hated me, and it was still hungry. I woke up the next day in the town's hospital. By that time I had been out for three days, and your grandfather had flown over after he heard the news. I was greeted with his tears and his warm hug after he saw me awake. I told him, and everyone else everything, about the thing, about uncle, everything. They didn't believe me, probably thought the number of hits I took on my head made me reimagine a little old bear as a monster. They did send out a search party, however, didn't find it, but found my uncle. The rumors spread how every bit of flesh, blood, organ, and even the bone marrow was stripped clean, and all that was left was a clutter of bones. He sighs. That wendigo is probably still out there, continuing to eat innocent people, continuing to hate me for being the one that got away. And there's more out there. More that will not stop until they are full, and they are never full, and never will be. He pauses. The most disturbing thought I have is that of my uncle's voice in my head when that wendigo had me on the ground. Sometimes I think, was it actually my uncle's voice telling me to get up? Or was it that thing, telling me to get up, wanting me to put up a little more fight, so it could make the kill so much better? Fifth story. I am a psychologist. My patient has wendigo psychosis. John had been my patient for months. I couldn't label him using official DSM codes. But he appeared to have what is known as wendigo psychosis. At the time of my initial assessment, there wasn't any direct evidence that he tasted human flesh, although I could tell it was a significant preoccupation with him, and suspected him in the creation of several recent grisly scenes. Just admiring the artwork in your office, John said to me one day. He grinned, letting me see to the teeth he filed down to fine points. So much red. I wonder if we're alike, you and I. I swallowed nervously. I couldn't report his Wendigo psychosis to the authorities though, because I would be perceived to be just as crazy as him. I couldn't even say he's a cannibal, even though he's come out and said his greatest fantasy is to devour a person over the course of three days. There was no proof. So much red, John repeated. Like a sea of blood making making its way to your kitchen table. He grinned again, seeming even more unstable. This has to stop, John. Right now, 
there's no direct evidence linking you to the murders, but if you keep eating people, your actions will eventually catch up to you. You haven't reported me yet. No evidence. No, I think it's because you like me. Deep down, you like me, David Morrison. Why? Why the hell would I like someone like you? I can't prove it, but I know you are a murderer. Not just that, a monster. John put a hand admiringly to his heart. You really think that about me? Yes, I do. I'd like to talk about your parents, John. My session with him ended a few minutes later, and I drove to the park, taking in the beauty of summer before heading home. My wife had gone on a business trip, so I had the place to myself. I unlocked the front door and stepped inside. I popped on the TV. Hannibal was on, but I stopped myself from changing the channel. For some reason, I had become intrigued by monsters. For some reason, I shook my head. The reason was clear. John, I put dinner in the oven, a chicken stuffed with carrots and onions. While that cooked, I decided to go into the basement, do some late spring cleaning. Turning on the light, I surveyed the pile of unruly boxes. A few cocoons struggled as they hung from the ceiling. Their inner cores were human, weak from neuroses or traumatic life events to the extent that they were willing to visit a lonely psychologist's house for free therapy. You're happier this way, I said. And you called me a monster, John replied for the cocoon of silk. I turned around, greeting John's sharp teeth and blood-red eyes. He looked like a droopy-eyed hunting dog. Did you come to eat me, John? John hesitated, then shook his head. No. I'm here to learn from you. From the master. You've obviously found a perfect way to ensnare your victims. Teach me. So I showed John how I spun a spider's web from my own hands. I was afraid he would eat me at first, and even though he stared at me with those hungry, blood-red eyes, he left with a cocoon of silk over his left shoulder. The Wendigo told me later that he could give me the hunger, the fire in my gut which would illuminate the path of my soul. I asked who had sent him. He told me John did, because he was so very grateful for the bundle of human flesh I gave him. A gift for a gift, the Wendigo said, disappearing into the basement gloom and leaving me alone with my thoughts. Thanks a lot for watching the video till the end. Subscribe to our channel Horror in Detail. Drop your opinions slash suggestions in the comments section. And like the video as it helps with the YouTube algorithm.